you know, you can, you can say words that you need to say, even if you don't mean it. Sometimes you tell, you have to tell someone, I'm sorry. And an insincere apology can be worth something, you know, it can help somebody heal instead of just, you know, being silent. So it's a lie. And I was able to manage it because it was just physical. I'm just moving my mouth. But in that sense, that's like a good example of it. And the reason I'm able to do it is because it's just, it's not me, it's just my body. Now, if I'm, he asked me what I really think, no, the guy doesn't deserve an apology, right? Okay, because I couldn't get myself to tell myself that lie, although it's probably the truth. He probably does deserve an apology. But the point is that the farther away something is from me, the more I can just sort of, um, you know, make it do stuff, and it doesn't have to be so, I don't have to take it so seriously. And, and it can be better than whatever I would have said right. I was really communicating. <laughs> right, right. I, thought, I, use, I use your words and your thoughts. They're not mine, but they're better than mine. Right, so, and sometimes use, that's the compassionate thing, is to tell people what they want to hear. Yeah. Not to get something out of them or manipulate them, but because that's the, the kind thing. Right. So it's not really lying. It's borrowing. <laughs> <laughs> it's not stealing. It's borrowing. It's yeah. like, like the comedian says, I worked in people's houses, and I knew you're not allowed to steal. But does it say any place you're not allowed to swap? <laughs> So I took his Rolex watch and I replaced it with a $10 one. Anyway, so it's not really lying. It's, it's um, tapping into something better than I would have on my own. And it's sincere. I sincerely wow. want to tell you something that isn't my idea. <laughs> right. But it's such a good idea. And it's also the, inter, the intertwined relationship between the three garments. There's thought, speech, and action, but there's the, the speech part of thought. Like when you're talking to yourself. Right. Thinking out loud. Right. Like the speech within thought. Right. And there's thought within speech, because you know you gotta think something before you speak. <laughs> and then there's the action. If you actual think, articulation. Right. So within speech, there's the action part. Within thought, even, there's the action part. So there... there what really we talked about before, the neurology. The action of thought is the... Whatever, whatever's happening, the electric impulses. Yeah. And then there's the, you know, the, the mind, that intangible, you know. So I think that leads us into... The Rebbe's mitzvah projects, ah, right. The, the most the most puzzling part of the Rebbe's projects, you stop a guy in the street, say, "Excuse me, you Jewish?" If he says yes, you put ah. on him. Right. Why don't you ask him if he believes in God and believes in putting on tefillin, or is in the mood? <laughs> Are you in the mood for tefillin? No, you don't ask him if he's in the mood if he believes it. You just roll up his sleeve and put the tefillin on his arm and on his head. What's the value of that? Right. And that, that's often the complaint. They say, well, it's hit and run. And, he's the, you know, it lasted for 90 seconds. He's going to walk away. And that's it. You didn't change his beliefs. You didn't convince him of anything. He just did something. It was a lie. Because a person can physically go along with something. And it wasn't that deeply meaningful, right? My body was there. My mind wasn't there. My heart wasn't there. And you didn't even ask him for his email address. That's right. Yeah. And and it's it's intentionally so. Don't get his name and number. No follow up. No follow up. It's none of your business what he does a minute later. But for this moment, you get him to put on tefillin. What's what's the virtue there? What's the virtue of lighting Shabbos candles and then not keeping Shabbos? That seems to be a little hypocritical, no? That, that's, that's an even more pointed question. Then what's the point of putting on tefillin if you're going to, you know, do something else 
a minute later, because I also do that. I finish davening and, you know, go do whatever you do that day. But lighting Shabbos candles, and you're not going to keep Shabbos. That's a real disconnect. Yeah. I'm ushering in the holiness of the day. Right. And there's nothing holy about the day. Yeah. Yeah, what's up with that? Well, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, we've been doing this like for 50 years. I was talking to somebody yesterday who uh, studies happiness from a psychological perspective, a neurological perspective. And I don't remember who he was quoting. And he said, we make, we, let me say this correctly. We make our habits and our habits make us. Basically, we're saying that although, you know, we make our habits, I guess that's an action that's a lie. But eventually our habits make us, that's an action that becomes true. So you got to start the cycle somewhere. So when you start, it's going to be a lie. But the power of action is that it does come back on us and have an effect on the insides. And in fact, you know, one of my favorite Maimodim, a uh, discourse from the Rebbe, by Yishlach Yeshua. It's uh, about the Haftorah from Parsha Shlach, which was my Bar Mitzvah Haftorah. And I often, on my birthday, will uh, recite this Mimer. But over there, the Rebbe explores a whole new level of Tanya. Tanya always explained how, look, if you were a tzaddik, you could master your emotions. But never, you know, you're not. So what do you do? What's second best? You master your behaviors, because anyone could do that. The Rebbe comes out and says, it's even more than that. It's that in a certain way, there's more power in managing behaviors than managing emotions. More leverage, let's say. When you get down low, the lower you get down, the more leverage you have, the more you can lift. And there's a rebound effect that when you focus on behavior, you end up, I guess, reverse engineering internal transformations. So it's not just a person did something and it lasted for 90 seconds and it's over. No, actually, that was the way that we start to rearrange the insides. When we couldn't reach the insides, and in fact, even if, I think the, the chiddush, the novel point here is, even if we could access the insides, we're going to get more bang for our buck by leveraging from the outsides, from the behaviors. So to go back to your question, if I had the opportunity, I have 90 seconds with a guy in a street corner, should I have a meaningful conversation with him or should I put on filling with him? What's going to be more impactful? No question. The, the, the behavior. Filling. Much more than a 90-second conversation or I would say even a 90-minute conversation. Which, by the way, begs the question, what are we doing here on Zoom and just saying a bunch of stuff, a bunch of deep, nice ideas, and nobody's doing anything? Like, turn off this video and go put on filling. You. Turn off the video and go put on tefillin if you didn't put on tefillin yet. Go take a take some money and put it in a in a tzedakah pushka. Now go do a mitzvah. Am Yeah. So so what does that mean? Hu The the action is primary or the essence. The essence of what? It's not like action is the only thing in the world. It is the most essential of, of what? Of life, of your personality, of your service of God. What, 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 where does action stand in that lofty position in a relationship? If it's not a relationship, then action is not greater or more powerful than your emotions or your intelligence. In other words, if I just want to know who you are, I'm not going to look at your actions because like you say, they can be a lie. I want to know who you really are. 
So I got to look past your actions and past your words because you can lie with your words. Mm -hmm. So to know who you really are, just one example, to know who you really are, I need to know what you long for. What do you yearn for? Then I know who you really are. But you're not going to tell me <laughs> what you yearn for. And maybe you don't even know yourself. So when is action primary in an interpersonal relationship? If I act for you, that is much more powerful than if I speak nicely to you or I think kindly of you. Or even if I love you, but if I don't do anything, the love remains in me. It is not doing anything for the relationship. It's not bridging the distance between us. So the greatest of the bridges is action. Because it's the most external. Like we were saying before, you can, you can detach from your action more than from your speech, which you can detach from more than from your thought, because it's the most external, which also is why it is the bridge with those who are other. So the more I can detach from myself, the more I can attach to you. So if I'm doing something for you, I'm really reaching into your world, stepping and out of my world, entering into your world. And conversely, I would infer from this that if I'm thinking about how much I love you, I'm not connecting to you as much as I am to myself. Right. right. But I'm so thinking about how much I love you. Now, <laughs> but it's all internal. Yeah. Like this man who says, if we get divorced, it would be such a shame because I have so much love to give. <laughs> and why don't you give it? <laughs> <laughs> you're keeping it all locked up somewhere. It doesn't do any good. You're a very loving guy, but <laughs> nobody's benefiting from it. So I remember the story. Uh, Shliach told me about his father, who had lived during the um, during the thirties, the, the, the crash. There was there were these people standing in line either for employment or for some assistance or whatever. All these poor people starving. His father was standing in line talking to a friend and a, a man came over and said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in so much trouble. I'm starving. I can't feed my family. And, and his friend, his father's friend said, I feel so bad for you. His father, the Shriach's father, reached into his pocket and he took out a dollar. Mm -hmm. And he said, I also feel bad for you. I feel a dollar's worth bad. Mm -hmm. And he said to his friend, and how bad do you feel? A dollar's worth? Will you reach in your pocket and do something or are you just going to feel sad? So when you ask somebody to put on tefillin, the reason it's legitimate and powerful and holy is because that's how you connect to God. Who asked you to put on tefillin? Not the kid in the street by the, by the tefillin truck. God needs you to put on tefillin. So when you put on tefillin, you are using action to step into God's world. Whether you know it or not, that's what you're doing. You're stepping into God's world. Because it's the only reason to put on tefillin. I haven't found any other. So that's where action becomes the primary thing because you're not doing it for yourself. In the context of a relationship, action is primary. Or, or all the garments are more important than the emotions. If your love doesn't make you think lovingly, it's not very useful in a relationship. If it doesn't move you to say something nice, to express it in words what you're feeling, and it's not going to do much good. And if you don't ever do anything, like the guy said, why do I have to be nice to my wife? We're already married. 
Mm -hmm. So the relationship is deep and profound. Why do I have to do an external, meet, you know, minor act? I got to get up and bring her something. We're married. This is serious. <laughs> so the person who lights Shabbos candles and isn't keeping Shabbos. Yeah. Obviously, they're independent because keeping Shabbos is a biblical commandment. Lighting Shabbos candles is a rabbinic commandment. So Shabbos existed independently of lighting candles. So what then is the, the role of the candle lighting? It's not like Shabbos can't happen without the candle. By lighting the candle, you're tapping into a holiness, not preparing for a holiness. It has a, it has a holiness of its own that is in some way different from Shabbos. And the most, the most telling uh, evidence of that is that on Shabbos, you're not allowed to light a candle. <laughs> There's a little bit of a, of a paradox. You right. bring in the Shabbos by lighting a candle, and then once it's Shabbos, you're not allowed to light candles. So it's, it's almost like they're incompatible. Lighting candles on Shabbos don't go together. So you have to be careful to light the candle before it's Shabbos, while it's still Friday. So the holiness of the candle is independent and it's kind of different than the holiness of Shabbos. So it's not hypocritical to light the candle and then not keep Shabbos. But, but the effect of, um, of introducing holiness into the world, knowingly or, or unknowingly, intentionally or, or, or unintentionally, it has changed the world. At least that's the way, the way I see it. Why all of a sudden are there kosher restaurants in Dubai, which nobody can afford? <laughs> <laughs> Seven star kosher restaurants. But who, who spoke to them about Judaism? Nobody. So where is all this holiness coming from? From the people who put on tefillin anywhere in the world, from the people who light Shabbos candles anywhere in the world, or put a coin in the tzedakah box, or go to the mikveh, this creates holiness. And holiness has no limits, not limited to time and space. So wherever you produce a little holiness, you're creating this potential that another government that used to be anti-Semitic will not be anti-Semitic, where Judaism could never enter, now it can. The world is becoming holier, and not through conversation, through the doing. So in all the years that the Rebbe was innovating these mitzvah projects, it literally transformed the world, like you say, from the bottom up. And it could not have happened any better, quicker, or more convincingly if we had tried doing it through speech, through learning, through, through arguing and explaining. That would not have gotten to the core of godliness. The core of godliness is that we can do for him. Yes, we can also quote his words. We can also think his thoughts as you study the Torah. You're thinking his thoughts. And that's awesome. But it is not as effective in transforming the physical world as the act of a mitzvah. So, hopefully, this conversation will be more than just talk but will move people to actually do something. Something? Or you have some uh, particular ideas? Well, something got... You know what people say, 
You know when people are hysterical, they say, do something. You know, they don't care what it is, just do something, right? And then you do something and they say, no, not that. <laughs> but why didn't you say so? <laughs> yeah. Do a mitzvah. Do something godly. And godly is not the same as goodly. There are a lot of good things people can do. It's not godly. And therefore it doesn't have that power. Godly means in the service of God. We were created to be his partners in creation. He created the world uh, in, in need of, of repair, which is again, a very important principle. We didn't mess up the world. Everybody thinks human beings mess up the world. And without human beings, the world would be so beautiful. <laughs> We are the clutter of the universe. No, the world is not a nice world. Nature is not kind or considerate or compassionate. Those things we bring to the world. So why is the world so messed up? We didn't mess it up. It's the lowest of all possible worlds before we got here. In fact, the reason we are here is to rectify, is to repair the lowness of this world and elevate it to become the highest of worlds. So we are here to serve him. That's godly. It's not just good. It's beyond good. A person who is sensitive and can't stand the sight of blood will never kill anybody. That godly? The instinct is not godly. It's natural. It's human. But if you do it because God asked you to do it, then it's godly. Then you're stepping out of yourself and you're entering God's world. What's real to him, what's important to him. And that is so powerful that even if you're not aware that this serves God's purpose, you're serving God's purpose anyway. Are there particular mitzvahs that are uh, more effective than others? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question of why did the Rebbe pick these 10 mitzvahs? There are 613. So firstly, the Rebbe picked positive mitzvahs. The Rebbe didn't tell you what not to do. Because there are so many things you're not allowed to do. The Rebbe didn't pick any of those. He picked positive mitzvahs. Uh, even Kashrut and Shabbos. Uh, well, Shabbos is not one of them. But Kashrus. He didn't say, don't eat non-kosher. He said, make, make, your, make your kitchen and your food kosher. The positive side of the negative commandment. And the same with mikvah. You can look at mikvah as there are times when you're not allowed to be intimate. It's a negative, right? It's a thou shalt not. Or you look at it as the positive. So the Rebbe is choosing positive things, and he chooses these 10. I think the Rebbe once explained it himself, that there are certain mitzvahs that serve as introduction, that open you up to all the other mitzvahs, like giving charity. Giving charity is the ultimate of the essence of all the mitzvahs. Because every time you do a mitzvah, you're doing an act of charity. You're giving God what he needs out of his world. So all the mitzvahs are included in the mitzvah of tzedakah, or can all be called tzedakah. Uh, putting on tefillin is equal to all the other mitzvahs. Uh, sh uh, the Shabbos candle, 
is lighting the light that illuminates your home and makes you uh, appreciate all the other mitzvahs, all the godliness around you. Having holy books in your home, it, it creates an atmosphere that in that that introduces all the other mitzvahs, inspires. So the Rebbe chose those mitzvahs that have the most, um, I don't know, opening effect. It opens you up to different kinds of godliness and holiness and and will lead to all the other mitzvahs. And the Rebbe very proudly, very happily announced that he heard that somebody lit Shabbos, a little girl lit Shabbos candles. The mother became a little uncomfortable with her daughter being more observant than her, so she also lit the Shabbos candles. And once they lit the Shabbos candles, it uh, didn't feel comfortable to then go shopping, so they stopped going shopping. And if they weren't going shopping and sitting at home and the Shabbos candles are burning, uh, you might as well make Kiddush. <laughs> and it kind of snowballed into many, many mitzvahs. So to the Rebbe, that was validation that yes, this mitzvah does open you up to other mitzvahs. More than more than others, because every mitzvah can bring another mitzvah. Mitzvah gereris mitzvah, right. All action has a certain momentum. So any mitzvah you do is going to lead to more mitzvahs. But there are certain mitzvahs that are let's say they have uh, even more leverage to get more momentum going. Yeah. They're more inclusive types of mitzvahs. And they're all actions. It wasn't uh, love God, fear God, believe in God. Or love your fellow Jew. Or Yeah, well, that one, yeah. Yeah. But even that, you know, that's an action. Like, how much do you care? A dollar's worth, right? Yeah. So doing godliness, of course it helps to know what godliness means and how important it is and how it is the essence of creation and the whole purpose of our existence, etc., etc. But the act itself is powerful enough to stimulate the appreciation of it. You get to appreciate it as you do it, which is the best way. Or as the Rebbe often said, you learn how to swim in the water, not near the water. <laughs> Stand there looking at the water, you'll never figure out how to swim. Mm -hmm. You got to get into the water. So look, I, I, I'm very optimistic about what's going on in the world. That sounds a little ridiculous, but... Because the way we were taught to view the world and uh, keep a record of its progress, progress for the world doesn't mean we're healthier or stronger or richer or smarter. Progress means we're becoming better. Because the only thing really missing in this world is godliness. There's evil and there's good. Getting smarter is nice, but that's not the point. Getting stronger is good, but that's not the goodness that's lacking. So if you want to know whether we're going in a good direction, Look at the moral standard of the world, not anything else. So the politics, the, the, the economy, and the health, these are all terrible distractions. People think the world is going, is going to ruin because uh, economically businesses are closing down. That is not the end of the world. If evil was increasing, that would be the end of the world. 
but evil is decreasing. People are becoming better. As a result, to some degree, as a result of the, um, of the corona, it's, it's forcing us to think more maturely, more centered, less scattered, less distracted. It may even be the cure for ADD. <laughs> yeah? You know anybody who complained recently about being ADD? I haven't. In fact, I haven't heard anybody complain about anything other than the corona. <laughs> we are very focused all of a sudden. So it's, it's, it, it has had a, a positive moral effect. It's not so good for the body. So one of the effects of the corona, the physical, from all the people I've spoken to who recovered from it, they all seem to say this in different words, that when you have it and you're having a hard time breathing and you don't know where this is going to go, it's almost like you give up on life. There's that feeling of, you know, if this is it, then that's it. And then you recover. We're, we're reinventing life, which is a good thing. And what I found is that you can actually talk to people about this, and you could not have spoken about this a year ago. Life is forever. Death is temporary. Now, is that turning the world upside down or right side up for a change? Death is permanent? Death is forever? That's morbid thinking. How did we ever accept that? Life with all of its beauty, with all of its meaning, with all of its importance is fleeting. But death is forever. That cannot be true. That is just a bad habit of thinking. This is the result of what's going on in the world. We have to rethink everything. If you want to get past the fake news, you got to get past all the fake news. And this attitude that life is fleeting and death is forever, that's bad news. Fake news not true. Life is forever. Death is temporary. Even the death of the body, temporary. It's got to be. It's the only thing that makes sense. So just the thought that death is forever is already depressing. <laughs> if you live with that, with that belief, you're already depressed. You've taken a chunk out of the enthusiasm for life. Because life is fleeting, it's here, it's gone, no big deal. Or you scare me into trying to achieve something because <laughs> you never know when your end. That, that's, that's, that's not a happy way to live, even if it does inspire you. But it inspires you with fear. anxiety. So before Mashiach comes, we got to fix that. Don't live because you're afraid to die. That's not called living. It's a new world out there. So I don't know if I convinced myself or I am convinced that there is good reason to be optimistic about the future. Really optimistic. Economically, we're going to do very well. Health will improve after this is over because the whole medical, the whole medical industry and world has sobered up 
not games anymore. And the weakness of the system and uh, the flaws in it have all come out. They're all exposed. It's got to get better. It's got to become more humane. It's got to become more empathetic. And then it'll be better. We'll be healthier people. Is that wishful thinking? It could be. Look, we know that it all, everything's good in the end. There's no surprise here. We know, we know the end of the story, right? The only question is, does everything get crazy and then at the last minute there's this slapped on Hollywood ending that just makes everything good out of nowhere? By the way, I call it a Hollywood ending. The, the Greeks invented it. They call it the, the deus ex machina. Just Literally, they had a guy on a crane who would fly in and be one of the gods and fix everything. Or do things, um, you know, evolve, progress naturally toward that outcome? Um, I think, you know, going back to what we were talking about, about doing mitzvahs, the more we're doing mitzvahs and having an effect on the world through our actions, the more we're going to naturally evolve into that happy outcome instead of it just being, you know, this sudden jolt of goodness and and we're actually producing it correct yeah 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 we're not, we're not spectators right it's cause and effect